Hey, good afternoon, church. It is great to be together on this Sunday. For those that don't know me, my name is Robin, and my wife Laura and I serve as the lead pastors at Lyft Church. We've been journeying through a, a series of conversations around defining important words that we often use in church life and in Christian life, but we struggle to define clearly. Words that we kind of think we know what they mean, but if you kind of put the question to people, often the meaning is not that clear. Today we're going to talk about the word worship. Now, worship, I don't know that there's anything more controversial and divisive in church life than worship, which is saying something because uh, that should just floor us. Worship is all obviously about worshiping God, about recognizing who God is and giving Him the praise that is rightfully due. No one would, I think, argue with that or be confused about that concept. Yet, for some reason, worship is a source of so much confusion and tension and discussion in the life of the church. Why is that? Today we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 12, which is beautifully going to invite us to a holistic picture of what worship is. Now, before I get into this, I want to give a bit of a story that, that sort of orients us to this idea of worship. Uh, years ago, I was in a band. I played guitar in sort of a, like a rock band, and uh, we had been gigging in, in all the bars and the, the sort of the, the, you know, the, the, the different like music venues in Hamilton. And uh, we had been given an opportunity to uh, play what we thought was like a convention in the U.S. Now, we were all Christians. We also did a lot of worship nights and those sorts of things. So we would have our own music, and then we would also do some worship stuff. And so... Uh, here we are, we're thinking like, this is our big break. We're going to go down to the U.S. We're going to break into a new market. We're going to make it as a band. And so we borrow my, uh, uh, my buddy's dad's uh, camper van and we went on tour, uh, or so we thought anyway. And so we drive down to uh, Pennsylvania, which it turns out we were in like small town America. And we're there to do... Uh, it turns out, not a convention, but we were basically playing music at the local, like, kids' camp at the local church. And uh, the deal was that we were going to do our own music on, I think, the Saturday night, and then we were going to do Sunday worship for this church. And we thought, okay, that'll be fun. We'll do kind of our big loud stuff, and then we'll do, like, uh, you know, full band style worship on the Sunday morning. So we do our, our, conf- or our, our set on, I think, the Saturday and it was fine. There was maybe 20 people there, children who had no idea what we were or what we were doing, and uh, it was a disaster, but that's fine. That's a story for another day. We thought, okay, that's okay. We will we'll salvage it on the worship event on the Sunday morning. Well, it turns out that this church had a real issue with drums and guitar, that they were of the devil. And uh, I'm like, well, you invited a rock band to come play at your church, and you didn't check that, you know, we have drums and guitar. And so, unbeknownst to us, we just about caused a split in this church. There was this huge debate, what do we do, what do we do? Meanwhile, we've got all of our gear packed up and loaded in and brought down to the U.S. all eager to play. So it turns out that um, we, we really stretched the boundaries And uh, I played electric guitar without any overdrive or distortion, just basically on clean channel. No drums, because drums are evil. And uh, and we led what I think is the strangest worship set of music I've ever done in my life. It was terrible. And we drove back to to Canada, and um, we stopped at the outlet mall on the way back, and I got a sweet backpack. And that was pretty much all that we got out of that trip. And uh, the band dissolved uh, about a year later. But... That story of, of sort of like a church having like an obsession around what worship is and what it needs to look like, we laugh at it, right? We say, oh, that's ridiculous. Maybe, maybe, maybe you don't. Maybe you I have issues with drums in church. I don't know. But we look at that and go like, that's so silly. Like, come on, like, don't be so vain. And yet, I've not yet been to a church where there isn't tension around or heard of a church where there isn't tension around what is worship. What does it mean to worship? Why do we worship the way we worship? So let's look at Romans 12 and try to see if we can wrap our heads around this. Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in, the view, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. 
This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect. What is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God? <coughs> what is worship? Well, actually, this passage in Romans 12 is giving us a really beautiful and comprehensive picture, and I want to break it down for us. So let's start at the beginning here, verse 1, therefore. Now, whenever you see therefore in Scripture, you have to ask the question, what is it there for? What's it referring to? Romans 12 marks the turning point in the, in, uh, the letter of Romans where Paul is turning his attention from explaining and articulating the nature of the gospel to helping the church uh, implement the implications of the gospel in the context of church life. Romans 12, in some way, is sort of a, a bit of a turning point in the book. And so the therefore that Romans 12, 1 is referring to is the previous 11 chapters um, about uh, what God has done to save us. And so it says here, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God. So later in this verse, he's going to call us to worship, but <clears throat> as we worship, what do we have in mind? What are we focused on? When we think about worship, what is the object of our attention? Well, according to Paul here, it's in view of the mercies of God. What does that mean? Which mercies of God is Paul referring to? Why would worship have something to do with the mercy of God? Well, it turns out that if we go all the way back to Romans chapter 1, and Romans 1 Paul uh, concludes an introductory section where he's explaining the core issue with humanity. He's unpacking what's wrong with us. Why do we have a problem? Why is it that the world is just not right? Why is it that humans can go into such deep, dark, and terrible places? What's wrong? And at the end of Paul's explanation of the core problem of humanity, he sums it up this way in Romans 1 verse 25. They exchange, it's humans, exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served what has been created instead of the Creator, who is praised forever. Amen. So the whole issue of humanity, according to Paul, is misdirected worship, misallocated worship. The following 10 cha or sorry, 11 chapters from chapter 1 to chapter 12 is Paul articulating a solution to this problem of misdirected worship. And then in Romans 12, what Paul is doing is helping us frame what true worship actually looks like. You see, Paul's point in Romans 1 is this, that we are all worshipers. All human beings were made to worship. <coughs> in fact, we can't help it. Human beings will always worship something. Why is that? Well, at its most basic sense, let's define the word worship. Worship is really about recognizing the worth of something, recognizing the value of something. And in a lot of ways, that's what we do as humans. We recognize the value of something. And in, a, in that sense, we worship it. But worship is deeper than just recognizing the value in something. It is placing our hope and our trust in that thing. That's what turns worship into worship, from just recognizing that something is good and valuable to beginning to place our hope, our trust, our identity, our future, our desires, our dreams, all of, all of who we are, we place it on top of something. And as humans, we will place our hope and our trust in something. We will worship something no matter what. We can't help it. It's the way that we are. And what humans have done is that we give our attention and our worship and our hope and our trust to something other than God. The core issue of humanity that Paul is opening up in Romans chapter 1 is that humans have placed their hope and their trust, their worship, somewhere other than God. We have worshipped the created rather than the creator. Each of us, you and I, all will worship. We have a tendency to worship things other than God. And we place our hope in them. I'll give you an example. For me, if I just let myself go and I don't pay attention, I'll tend to worship like being really 
really accomplished, accomplishing something. An accomplishment can become that which I worship. It can become like an idol. An idol is something that we worship. <coughs> we will all worship something. What is it that you worship in your life? Maybe it's success. Maybe it's safety. Maybe it's comfort. Maybe it's uh, the hopes and the dreams that you have. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's a significant other. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's the children. We all worship and place our hope and our trust in something other than God. That is the human condition. So let's go back to our verse. If that's our core issue, Paul says here, therefore, in view of the mercies of God. In view of the mercies of God. You see, God has all the reason to receive our worship. He is God. He's the creator. And yet we don't give it to him. He doesn't get the worship that is due to him. And so that places us in separation from God, in broken relationship with God. And the story of the gospel, the story of Jesus, is about how even though we worship the created rather than the creator, even though we place our trust in places other than God, God has proactively reached out to reconcile us to himself. As Paul says in Romans, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The mercy of God is the fact that even though we were made to worship God, and even though we don't worship God, God has desired to reconcile us to himself. The mercy of God is Paul reminding us of the gospel. The fact that we, although we have rejected God, God has not rejected us. And so our posture of worship, we come to worship with a posture that says, God, thank you for receiving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for accepting me, even though I have rejected you. Now, what does this have to do with like corporate church worship? Why is the gospel so important? Well, because it means that the object of our worship is God. But so often... The object of our worship, what our attention is on is in our worship is ourselves. We tend to think about ourselves when we worship. And Paul say, here says, in view of God's mercy, the focus of our worship is God and what he has done in our lives. You're like, no, no, I don't, I don't worship myself. I, I come to worship and it's all about God. But let me ask you some questions. And these are questions that I've all been guilty of. So this isn't me pointing the finger. This is me just, I think, calling a spade a spade, which is that we come to worship and we find it hard to worship if we had a bad week. And maybe we're, we're not in the mood and, uh, you know, we're stressed out. And so our worship is kind of flat and it's sort of tokenism. That's not worship in view of God's mercy. It's worship in view of ourselves. Or let me ask you this. Have you ever struggled to worship because you know that there's a sin issue in your life? A sin issue in your life. Maybe you, you have a habit that you're trying to break and you haven't been able to break it. Something in your life that is holding you back. And, and, and so you come to worship and you, you're hesitant to worship. You're hesitant to press into worship because all you can see is your sin. And yet Paul here says, in view of God's mercy, when we come to worship, the emphasis is not on our sin. It's on the grace and the mercy of God. What qualifies us to worship is not that we had a good week and that we're sinless and that we're perfect. What qualifies us and invites us into the place of worship is an appreciation of how much God loves us. So often in worship, we're so focused on ourselves, our condition, our mood, that we actually don't even have the view of God's mercy in mind. Do I like the song? In fact, a lot of the way that we structure worship causes us to behold and have uh, man in view. And what I mean by that is the person on stage, the person who's singing. We behold them. We watch as an observer someone that is uh, singing a song. And often worship causes us to have in view uh, a performer as opposed to the mercies of God. True worship starts with us having in view the mercies of God. And so worship leaders across our church, 
one of the things I love about our church is that, uh, especially in our smaller campuses, like worship is really simple. But even in its simplicity, worship leaders, your job is to be invisible, is to draw people's attention to the mercies of God. I remember a number of years ago, our church had uh, grown quite a bit, and we had several hundred people coming out, and <coughs> I didn't really know why people were there. And I can remember there was a week where the worship team was just off. The singer that was singing was off key, and it just wasn't right. And I remember standing in the crowd, um, nobody really knew I was there, and I remember there were two guys in front of me who were kind of like, you know, sort of standing like this, disengaged, and they were sort of like... I overheard them talking to each other, oh man, this girl really can't sing, complaining about the music. And I remember thinking to myself, these guys don't understand what worship is. Maybe the worst music is great one week, maybe it's terrible, but actually worship has nothing to do with that. We could go out and hire a great team, get the best talent on stage, and create a wonderful experience for people. But that's not worship, that's entertainment. And often we confuse worship and entertainment in church life. Worship starts by having in view the mercies of God. Let me say that again. Worship starts by having in view the mercies of God. Whether we like the band or the songs or the people or whether we've had a good week or a bad week, it has nothing to do with it. Worship is all about the mercy and the grace of God and the fact that He has saved us and redeemed us. And so with that in mind, this idea that worship is not about us, worship is about who God is, we get to the next part. In view of the mercies of God, Paul says, I urge you to present your bodies. I urge you to present your bodies. So let's break this down. Paul says, I urge you to present. Let's focus on that part. To present indicates that there is intention in worship. Worship requires an intentional uh, uh, coming to you, like it's not accidental. I urge you to present. Paul's saying, come ready to worship. When you think about your life and you think about how you're gonna, uh, how you're gonna worship, do so purposefully and intentionally. It means that worship is a choice. Worship is a choice. And this can be really hard because there are days where we don't want to worship. Where, we're, where we feel discouraged or maybe something really difficult is going on in our lives. And it causes us to, to be like, I don't, I don't want to worship. And Paul's saying here, in view of God's mercy, because your attention is on who God is and how great he is and how much he loves you and how much he has saved you, make the choice to worship. Even when it's hard, even when it's struggling. In fact, in those moments, the choice to worship is the most important choice that we can make. Paul's point here is not that we need to um, make ourselves presentable before God uh, in the sense that somehow we have to come having achieved good enough. In fact, Paul's point here is that we can't achieve good enough. We cannot ever come to worship holy enough, pure enough, righteous enough. We can only come to worship because of the grace and the mercy of God. Yet, even as we come, it is still important that we make the choice to worship. This means, like really practically, what does it look like to make the choice to worship? It means that when we show up to worship in a formal congregational sense, like at, on a Sunday gathering, we show up having already decided that we're going to worship. It means we show up like really basic, like on time. You know, I urge you to present yourselves to God and then we show up 15 minutes late to worship. It's like, no, like show up on time, come punctual, come ready to worship. Uh, we show up and, and, and we're distracted, we're thinking about our week. I urge you to present. That means that we've already decided to put down the concerns from the week and press into worship. Worship is a choice. And it means that we, as we come to a place of worship, we have made the choice that we are going to worship. That we are going to worship. And we've made that choice before we get there. I urge you to present. Come prepared. Come ready to present yourself. Now, he says here, what do we present? We present our bodies. I urge you to present your bodies. Why does Paul say bodies? Well, as human beings, we're not uh, just all head or all heart or all body. 
we're actually, uh, there's, we're a tripartite person, which means that there's three parts to us. We have spirit, soul, and body. And one of the beautiful things about worship, especially music and dancing, is that it brings together all three parts of who we are. When we worship, we're bringing together our spirit, our soul, and our body in unity together. <coughs> Music is, in many ways, a complete human experience. When we sing in worship, we are bringing our soul, our spirit, and our body into alignment around a truth. And that's a beautiful thing. In a lot of ways, dancing is a similar expression of worship because dancing involves our soul, our spirit, and our bodies. And that's why dancing is often talked about in the scriptures as part of the worship. We sing and we dance before the Lord. Something I'd love to see in our church is more dancing, more exuberance in our worship, because our worship should be an expression physically of what we believe in our minds. We don't worship statically. We don't worship passively. We don't worship stoically without emotion. We worship bringing all of our humanity together. The thing is, some people say, well, I'm not a dancer, I'm not a singer, I'm not an exuberant type of person. But the truth is that every culture and every people group across all of history sings and dances. That's part of what it means to be human. Now, maybe you're like a more shy person and other cultures are more exuberant than others, but all cultures have some component of singing and dancing. All of them. And, I would ex and so Paul's point here is that our worship, when we worship, we bring all of ourselves to worship. And then he says here, your bodies. He says, when he says your bodies, it's really interesting that it's a plural, your bodies. So I urge you to present your bodies. He doesn't say your body. He says your bodies. He's speaking to the church. Remember Romans 12. It's all about how the church expresses um, the truth of the gospel communally. The rest of Romans 12 is all about how each person has a gift, and that gift is for contributing to the body. Paul's point here is that worship is communal. We don't just worship on our own. We can worship on our own for sure. But the kind of worship that he's speaking about here is the coming together communally to worship. And this has a couple of implications. It means that when we worship, our posture affects everyone. When we worship, we don't worship as individuals in a, in standing and observing a performance. We worship as a community. So the way you worship, whether you're in the crowd or on stage, is important. It affects so we sing and we dance together. Now, let's keep going. I urge you to present your bodies as a what? As a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. This is our true worship, to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. What does that mean? See, a sacrifice is all about value. Sacrifice is not a negative thing. Sacrifice doesn't mean drudgery and being miserable. Sacrifice is about recognizing what we value. The sacrificial system in the Old Testament was designed to help people assign a value to the consequences of sin. When somebody sins, there was a sacrifice that helped associate a concrete consequence or value for that sin. So sacrifices allowed people to properly value the consequences of sin. Similarly, when we come to worship and offer a sacrifice, we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, what Paul is saying here is we offer our bodies as a sacrifice in recognition of the value of God, of the worth of God. As we worship, we assign value to God by offering our lives to live for Him. And in this way, worship is tremendously powerful. Because as a living sacrifice, we are worshiping every day. We offer our bodies as a choice to say, I'm going to give my life to make disciples, reach the lost, serve the poor. And those are the ways that we worship. Our entire body and our entire self is a living sacrifice before God. So our worship actually doesn't start 
on Sundays or in song or with music, our worship starts by offering our lives as a sacrifice, by recognizing the value of God. Then when we come to corporately worship in song, we are reminding ourselves why we offer our bodies as living sacrifices. It's an ongoing reminder. The truth is that worship is costly. It's costly because it requires that we recognize the value of something. But for many of us, worship has become something that doesn't cost us anything. We show up to church, the worship team is already set up, the music's nice, they pick the songs that we like. And in fact, the whole experience is designed to make it as comfortable as possible. <coughs> but Paul's point here is that actually all of life is worship. All of life is about offering our lives as a sacrifice. Sunday corporate worship, the gathering of the saints to sing to God, should be a reflection of the rest of our lives. If the rest of our lives aren't a living sacrifice, then our corporate singing really doesn't make any sense. So the question when we think about when we come to worship, we have to ask, what does my life say that I value? What do I care about? What's important to me? Our corporate gathering to worship is the overflow of our lives, not the aspiration of our lives. Let me say that again. Our corporate gathering to worship is the overflow or the result of our lives, not an aspiration of our lives. We come to worship to remind ourselves of how we're living and worshiping as living sacrifices every single day. And this is why worship, Paul's uh, final sentence here, he says, offer yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. We worship to please God, not ourselves. Our life as worship is really not about pleasing us, it's about pleasing God. But so often when we think about worship, we're asking it ourselves, how does this please me? Maybe not honestly, maybe not uh, you know, consciously saying, you know, how does this please me? But we kind of ask the question, like, do I like the song? Do I like the music? Do I, does it, do I like how it makes me feel? Worship is actually about learning to allow the deeper realities of God's grace to become the object of our attention. We become so focused on God's grace that we can't help but worship. We can't help but worship. There has to be a connection between our, our lives, our living sacrifices, and when we come to worship God. And the goal of our life is to please God. And then when we come to gather and worship, we get to celebrate like, God, I get, to, I get to live a life that pleases you. I get to honor you. And so I'm gonna worship you with everything that I have. So often there's a disconnect between our lives and our worship. Our worship, we, we expound the majesty of God in, in our corporate worship, but our lives say that we kind of don't value God so much. And what we need to do is we need to confront that in humility and say, God, I want to live a life of worship. This is not to say we shouldn't worship, but to say that when we come to worship in song, we need to come with a posture of humility and repentance that says, God, I want to worship in a way that is pleasing to you. God is not interested in us singing songs if our lives are not honoring him in worship. Let me say that again. God is not interested in us singing songs of worship if our lives are not songs of worship. In James, for example, it talks about religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Worship is not some aspirational idea. It's not about pleasing ourselves about actually bringing all of our life to God and saying, God, I want to please you with my life. And then when we sing, we remind ourselves of that. But here's the best part of worship. When we worship, it also changes us. 
Paul says, after calling us to this true worship, he says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect. As we worship, as we bring our true worship, it actually transforms our mind. It renews us. It changes us. Worship is not a dry, stale, or boring endeavor. It's transformational for us, and that's why we're attracted to it. As we give praise to God, God actually encounters us in our worship. He meets us in the place where we are. And as we do that, we become conformed to the image of God. We become molded into the image of God. As we behold the mercies of God, as we offer our lives as living sacrifices, we actually become made more like God as a result. I want to close with a story where I, about the person who taught me this more than anybody else, and it was actually my granny. My granny was a wonderful South African lady, and she loved Jesus with her whole heart. And she knew how to worship like nobody I've ever really known. She was married to, my, obviously, my grandfather. My grandfather was a hard man. He uh, drank a lot and was quite verbally abusive. And, and life was very difficult for my granny. My grandfather did not follow the Lord. My, my granny became a follower of Jesus, I believe, in her 40s as an adult. And she said to me, you know, Robin, often t when times were difficult with your grandfather, I would be hurt by something he, he would say. He'd criticize me or be mean or harsh. And so what I would do is I would go to the kitchen and I would just sing the praises of God. And I would sing to the glory of God. And, and she would say, often I didn't really feel like doing that. Often it didn't feel that good. Often it didn't feel um, so true. But she said, I would sing and worship God until my heart believed that it was true. She would so sing and she would dance. And if you knew her, she would, she would literally dance by herself in the kitchen, singing to the glory of God until her heart was, until her mind and her heart were renewed by the truths of God. Instead, instead of fixating her attention on the pain and the difficulty of life, she had the mercies of God in view. And so she would worship and worship and worship. Oftentimes when we worship, we worship in response to how we're feeling. But in fact, true worship is that we come to worship God in view of his mercy, his love for us. And as we do that, we encounter his grace and his love for us. Worship is not a one-dimensional thing where we just throw worship up. It's a two-dimensional relationship where as we worship God, God encounters us. So I encourage you to take whatever aspect of, of this message, whether you need to hear the part of the call to focus on the mercies of God, not yourself or what's going on or even your own sin, or maybe the call to, to embrace uh, worship as a physical thing with your body, to bring actually your whole self to worship, prepared and ready to worship, or the call to bring yourself as a living sacrifice. We worship with all of our lives, not just when we sing. I pray that as we do that, as we start to embrace a biblical picture of what worship looks like, we would be a people that are encountering the power of God who is renewing us and conforming us to the image of his son. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word that calls us to worship in um, such a rich and a beautiful way, a way that is so much bigger than our human experiences. And Lord, I pray that our church would be a church of true worshipers, those who, with, in view of your mercy, are just offering our lives as living sacrifices. Thank you, Jesus, for this time. And I pray that, that you would cause an even greater heart of worship, recognizing your worth and placing our trust in you to be the reality of this church. Amen. Awesome. Well, that's it for me. Hope you guys have an awesome week. Be blessed.